Okay, welcome to the lecture number nine. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to discuss pretty important topic in the entire statistics, and I'm going to uncover the big secret why normal distribution is such uh, an important one and it plays the role of celebrity in the world of statistics. But before we uh, get uh, to the lecture itself, I want to point out that right after our chapter where we discussed in the last two lectures uh, normal distribution and standard normal distribution, I have posted the R script. So pretty much everything that we did uh, we wrote the code and I showed you how to use the two functions, right? Q norm, uh, P norm, and Q norm to find probabilities given values and to find values given probabilities in the right tail or in the left tail of the normal distribution. Okay, so this is the script that I just saved and uploaded, and now let's move on to the sampling distribution. Now, for that, I have to open that PowerPoint. Hold on just one second, there it is. Okay, so what exactly is a sampling distribution? All right, um, so in the either third or fourth lecture, I can't remember right now, we discussed that statistics deals with study of population. And population is everything, anything and everything you might possibly know about a certain subject matter, such as salaries of humans, MPGs of the cars, right? How tall are different people, etc., etc., etc. So if you could collect uh, data about every single possible subject matter, uh, that is population data. Well, unfortunately, we discussed. That is not realistic, not going to happen in most of the cases uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, plain impractical, okay, or, or plain impossible. Like, for example, if I want to collect data about people's salaries, some people will tell me to take a hike. I'm not telling. Who are you? Why am I supposed to tell you something like that, okay? So, oopsie-daisy, cannot collect that data. Uh, it can be uh, very time-consuming, even if people were willing to tell me their salaries and they imagine how much time can I spend just asking them, uh, asking every person, for example, in the city of Newport News, how much money they're making, it's enormous time. Therefore, it's enormous expense as well. can be impractical sometimes. For example, if I'm running the uh, car manufacturer company, one thing that I want to know is uh, if my airbags deploy in 100% of the head-on collision cases, right? How do I know if it deploys all the time or not exactly all the time? Well, I have to take every single car that I produce, smash it into the concrete block, and just find out, okay? In what percentage of cases does the airbag, the sensor deploys the airbag? Well, guess what, genius? You just destroyed all of your car output and you have nothing to sell. Well, on the upside, you know exactly what your percentage of the air, uh, bear, uh, airbag deployment is. Okay, That's impractical, of course. So therefore, statisticians basically say, all right, we accept the fact that we cannot get data about the entire population. Fine. What's the next best thing? The next best thing is a sample. So I'm not going to collect all 2 billion possible observations. I'm going to settle for... 10,000, for example. 10,000 is a sample. So the question then becomes, okay, so if I keep collecting different samples, or even one sample, right, how can I make conclusions about the population if the uh, huge number of observations are not there, okay? So if I'm, if, for example, I know that my population is 2 million possible numbers, but I collect only 2,000, what I'm missing about, like, what, 99.99% of all uh, observations that I could have collected but I didn't because it was expensive, time-consuming, impossible, whatever the reason are, right? How can I make conclusions about the population if all I have is teeny tiny small sample, small fraction of what it can possibly be, okay? So let's turn our attention to a sampling distribution. So let me tell, uh, tell you right off the bat that sampling distribution is the distribution of all possible sample averages in the case when our data is numerical and we can compute the average okay so 
let's get a practical example. Let's say I am running the uh, production plant, okay, that fills the bottles, bottling plant, Coca-Cola or Pepsi, doesn't matter. So some bottle drinks. Uh, if you ever been uh, to a grocery store, I mean, that's stupid, of course, everybody been to the grocery store, right? If you've been to the uh, aisle with uh, soft drinks, then you can see identical bottles filling long shelves, right? And if you kind of look across the caps on the bottles, you can note that uh, notice that uh, the level of the liquid, the drink inside each bottle is not the same. In some bottles, it's a little bit higher. In some bottles, it's a little bit lower. Well, what does that mean? That means that uh, different bottles contain different amount of liquid, right? How can that be? If the, on the outside of a bottle, it says, for example, two liters. Uh, it appears that every bottle is different. That is correct. Every bottle is different. And the reason for that is variability. That is uh, built into the process. So uh, the bottles are being filled by the machine, right? And the machine basically, it measures the amount of liquid that comes through. And when, uh, uh, when, when it measures exactly what the bottle is supposed to have, then it shuts off the valve and that's it okay but when exactly this valve shutoff happens it can happen a millisecond uh, earlier or millisecond later it will affect the amount of liquid inside the bottle right so therefore the truth of life is can't make two different bottles to be identical it's impossible okay because there are teeny tiny variations teeny tiny um, changes from one bottle to another bottle and no matter what we do we cannot get rid of them we can make them smaller probably but they they will still be there okay so no two different items are created identical so let's say i'm concerned with the quality control and the quality control means it's my responsibility as the manager of the plant to make sure that every bottle gets uh pretty much the same amount but i know it's impossible so i'm going to say if on the label it says 32 ounce bottle i'm going to make sure that on average if i take all my bottles and measure exactly how much liquid inside each of them i have and then calculate the average then this average is going to be 32 so yeah sure some bottles will be underfilled and yeah sure some bottles are going to be overfilled but on average i'm putting 32 ounces in the bottle and that's what it's supposed to be uh, on the outside on the label okay cool so uh as the part of my quality control here's what i'm going to do i'm going to take out of my production line periodically randomly purely randomly at different times of the day maybe multiple times a day four bottles randomly four bottles open them up measure how much liquid is inside how much drink is inside and after that i'm going to calculate the average for the sample right so Sample of four, nine o'clock, sample of four. The average is, let's say, 31.8 ounces. Then 12 o'clock, another sample of four. The average turned out to be 32.36. Then two o'clock, another sample of four. The average turns out to be 31.96, okay, etc., etc. So each time since my bottles I'm, that I'm picking are going to be uh, picked randomly, and each one of them has unpredictable to a certain degree amount of liquid inside, I can expect that every measurement is going to be different and therefore averages are going to be different right simple as that so here's actually a cool uh animation that took me a really long time to put together so on the top over here i'm going to uh, record my individual bottles right so i pick up four bottles i measure what how much liquid i have inside and record that so here's my first example here are the four bottles right so you can see that the amount of drink inside of them is different and i'm going to calculate the average the mean and here on the top i'm going to uh, plot my individual bottles every single one of them and here at the bottom i'm going to plot sample averages okay so for each group of four bottles it's going to be just one number so like that here's my sample average here are my four observations and I get the next sample Bam! everything is different right and the mean is different too so I put the mean down I put the bottles individual bottles up there another sample here's my average 
Here are my four bottles. Next sample. Here is my average. Here are my bottles. Next sample. My average. And the bottles go to the group of... Yeah, so another sample. Alright, and it keeps going, right? During the day I collect many, many, many different samples. Alright, here's another one. Okay. All right, so what can we tell? Well, on the top, if I keep doing that again and again and again and again, I'm going to get distribution uh, of um, uh, individual bottles, right? How much liquid, how much drink I have inside each and every individual bottle. So this is pretty much my population, okay? If I take gazillion different samples on the top i'm going to start seeing the shape that's forming and that is the uh, population distribution okay some bottles are severely underfilled some are you know severely overfilled but most of them will be concentrated around what my mean is supposed to be at the bottom though i'm going to have a different thing right all each and every one of these points represents an average of the sample right so over here i'm going to start seeing a different shape forming up and that's precisely what we mean by the sampling distribution it is the distribution of all possible sample averages in the cases when i can calculate the sample average and we know that averages are calculatable for the numerical data only right we can calculate average for the uh, nominal data because they're categories they're not numbers and exactly the same reason we can't calculate the average for the ordinal data. They're categories, they're not numbers, okay? So at the bottom, I have distribution of all possible sample averages, otherwise known as sampling distribution, and on the top is my population. So if I keep doing, oh, um, yeah, so let, let's, let's, let's discuss how the averages are related to each other. So here is my average for the population, and here is my average for the sampling distribution. And they are the same. It's a universal property. Okay, so uh, the average for the population is the same as the average for the distribution of all possible sample averages, also known as sampling distribution. How about the variability? Well, variability is the measure of the spread. Correct? We discussed that. The higher the spread to the right and to the left, the higher is the variability. You can see that spread is much higher much larger on the top than it is on the bottom right so therefore variability is lower for the sampling distribution okay and uh, yeah so here are the roughly boundaries of my population distribution and here are the boundaries of my sampling distribution so i can see that sampling distribution is more compact it's less variable so if i keep doing uh, my sampling four bottles and four bottles and another four bottles etc many many times over then i'm going to have this picture forming up okay so on the top i have normally distributed um, measures of individual bottles right and at the bottom i'm going to have uh, also appears to be normally distributed but these are all sample averages right but that concept is a little bit high, hard to kind of grasp um, what are we doing right why why are we interested in that so you take samples a lot of them you calculate the average sample it's going to be different for each sample and then you kind of plot the distribution of all x bar sample averages that's a little weird but that's what sampling distribution is okay so uh at that point what i want to do is switch over to the pretty cool online demonstration that will allow me to kind of make a point okay so let me go ahead and click on that one all right, so this is just a cool uh, online um, uh, web page that I found, and it illustrates the relationship between uh, sampling distribution and the population distribution. Okay, let's start with number five right here. So this is these are our choices. Okay, this is how our population is distributed, and you can see that we have eight different options. Right, number five looks like normal. Right, it's a unimodal. There is only one peak bell-shaped 
and it also goes down pretty quickly on the right and on the left. So let's let's say five is normal. Seven is skewed, right? It's right skewed. So you have data, a bunch of data, right at the beginning, and then long tail in the right direction. Eight is even more skewed, right? Very right skewed distribution. Six is by model, right? You have one peak and another peak. We saw distribution like that a few lectures ago when we looked at uh, phone bills, right? It was a bunch of phone bills for the low uh, dollar values. There was a valley in the middle, and then uh, on the high end for the high dollar values there was another peak. Okay. Then uh, in the first row I have a bunch of weird distributions, right? This one is called uniform, okay? Because it's all the same. Uh, across all possible values, right? That is kind of slanted triangular distribution, so to speak, right? This is, I don't even know what it is, V-shaped distribution, okay? So you have a bunch of data at the low uh, end, you have a bunch of data at the high end, and kind of nothing in between, right? And that is, uh, again, kind of a version of this bimodal distribution, right? So let's start with number five. Uh, sample size. Okay, so I chose here a population size to be medium. So I believe when you pick it small, it's around 10,000 observations. When you pick it medium, it's around 30 or so thousand observations. And that gives you actually a pretty good uh, animation. So what I'm going to do here is start uh, changing sample size, draw a bunch of samples. And here in this uh, yellow uh, area, I'm going to have the program to plot for me the sampling distribution, okay? In other words, distribution of all possible sample averages. Well, on my sample size is one, that's it, right? So I pick one item at a time, what's the average? I pick one bottle, I measure how much liquid is in this bottle, and this is it, that's the average, right? So when the sample size is one, really what I'm getting is the population distribution. It's not even sampling distribution, right? I don't average anything. It's it's an army of one, so to speak. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, draw a bunch of samples. And right now I'm looking at normal population, right? And indeed, population is normal, right? And population is 31,800, right? So that's random. But that, let's note actually uh, that one, okay? The mean is 50.2 for that sampling distribution. And the sigma is 18.5. Now let me increase sample size. So let's say now I'm getting, I don't know, five bottles, right? And measure the exact amount in five bottles and calculate X bar, sample average. So again, mean 50.2, sigma 18.5. I'm going to draw a bunch of samples. So this is my distribution of sample average. You can see that it's less variable, right? It doesn't go that far on the right and on the left. So mean uh, remained about the same, right? It's not exactly the same because it, it uh, takes random samples, right? But it was 50.1 or something like that, 49.9. Sigma, though, decreased, right? It was 18 point something, and now it's 8.3. Okay, and the distribution, I want to point out, is normal, right? And before that, it was normal as well. Okay, so how about if I increase it to 10 and draw a bunch of samples? mean is again it mean doesn't go anywhere it stays about the same but standard deviation goes down from 8.3 it went to 5.8 and the distribution is normal what if i make it 20. draw 49.9 the mean doesn't go anywhere and uh standard deviation goes down right and the distribution stays normal so the bottom line here is that if my original population is normal then my sampling distribution will be always normal the mean doesn't go anywhere, it remains the same, but sigma is getting smaller. And we see it visually, right? The shape of the distribution becomes more and more concentrated, right? Uh, it, uh, it's not as variable to the right and to the left. Okay, so let's now go with number seven. That is mildly right skewed distribution. Okay, and I'm going to again, just get the picture of the population first, sample of one, right? Okay, draw, and it should follow the same same shape. And it does, right? So this is a right skew distribution, which looks like this one. Okay, cool. Let me go ahead and increase... Oh, yeah. Uh, let's note this one, right? 38.7 is the mean. Sigma is 20... Well, it's called 22. So let me increase that to 5. Draw again. 
38.5 mean didn't change much but standard deviation did go down quite a bit right and uh, look at the shape my original was very much skewed right it was visibly skewed to the right this one i can still see the skew that tail is a little longer but overall the shape is pretty much normal right okay let me increase that to 10 and do it again so 38.5 right 9.8 Get a bunch of samples, plot sample averages. 38.6 mean doesn't uh, uh, doesn't change much, but standard deviation did go down 7.0. So let me get uh, 20. 38.6, 7.0. It's still 38.6, but now I have 4.9, and it looks pretty darn normal, right? So you can see that even though my original shape let me go down to one right even though my original shape was far from normal okay when i get to decent sample size like 20 bottles at a time uh, then the sampling distribution distribution of all possible sample averages looks very much normal well let's make things more extreme right uh, very right skewed distribution now decrease draw okay and there it is very much right skewed 24.4 and the standard deviation 21.6 let me go up to five what happened to the mean didn't go anywhere still 24.4 21.5 was standard deviation now it's 9.7 okay so it seems like uh, I, i'm starting to see the pattern right as i increase the sample size my mean doesn't mean really uh, the average remains the same okay but the sigma starts from large values and then it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as my sample is getting higher and higher and higher okay and also the shape look at the shape what happens with the shape that one is still right skewed i can see right but it's not as extreme as it was originally so let me increase that to 10. so 24 4 9 7. 24.3 not much of a change and from 9.7 i went down to 6.8 so you can see that the tails are kind of getting uh we're getting rid of tails right and now it's looking i can see the right skew but it's more normal so let me go up to 20. okay 24.4 4.8 so sigma is even smaller and now i can barely see this skew right um so it's, it's it's looking very normal let me go up to 30 it doesn't go any higher than 30 so draw from 4.8 my standard deviation is now 3.9 24.2 and that is pretty normal distribution okay well let's let's look, take a look at this one number six so first i'm going to plot the population itself it's supposed to have two peaks right by model there you go as your by model distribution 45.4 21 let's go up to 5 draw 45.2 didn't go very far but standard deviation did change it went down right and the shape look at that originally i had these two uh valleys right or two peaks right now i can i can't even see the previous peak right so when i started to take random samples of five average out these numbers and plot all possible resulting sample averages all of a sudden the the shape is changing right so now i see the normal distribution more or less let's go up to 10 and let's see what happens so 9.3 45.2 so the mean now is 45.3 didn't go anywhere 6.6 .6. standard deviation went down and the shape is looking very much normal so what do we see basically we see that no matter how uh, weird your distribution of the population is as you start increasing the sample size and calculate averages for a larger and larger and larger number of bottles in the sample right first of all mean doesn't go anywhere right pretty much stays the same standard deviation is getting smaller uh, so therefore your distribution is getting less and less wide 
And also, even though you started with some weird shapes, it all comes down to normal at the end. Okay, so let's actually take a look at these uh, four because it's fun, right? Okay, so this is uniform. Uniform means that it's all the same probability across the range of values from 0 to 100 in this case, right? Uniformly distributed, so you're equally likely to get any of these numbers from 0 to 100. Okay, so let's get, uh, let's actually see what happens when I have 2. That's kind of funny. When I have 2, the result is triangular distribution. Imagine that. The reason for that is very simple, actually. Uh, if you kind of uh, imagine that this, if you cut this distribution in half, then uh, most of your possible samples of two, right? You have two observations. Uh, uh, most of your samples will be like this. One number is from the left side of the distribution. Another number is going to be from the right side distribution. Okay, so in other words, uh, the possibilities you get two numbers, right? Uh, option number one is one number is from the left and another number is from the left. In this case you get average somewhere over here, right on the left side. Another possibility is number one is on the left, number two is on the right. Then the average is going to be somewhere here in the middle. Number three possibility is your number uh, one is on the right and number two is on the right, in which case your average is going to be here on the right. and Last one is your number one is on the right and number two is on the left. In this case, your average is going to be in the middle. So out of four possibilities, you will end up in about a quarter of cases with the average on the right side, and about a quarter of cases with the average on, uh, on the left side, about a quarter of cases average on the right side, and uh, in about two quarters of cases, the average is going to be somewhere in the middle. That's why you have a peak, because more cases correspond to one observation is on the right, another is on the left, and the average is in the middle. Okay, that's kind of a uh, very simplified layman explanation of why you have triangular shape. It's kind of funny that it forms up this way. Okay, so let's go up to five. Uh, now I'm ge getting five numbers, right, from uh, anywhere between zero and a hundred. Well, let's see what happens. But I need to notice that mean is fifty, and sigma is twenty point four. All right. Uh huh. So, mean is still 50. Standard deviation is 13 now, it went down. And the shape starts to look like what? Surprise, surprise, it's a normal distribution, right? Let me go to 10. I'm guessing that my mean will remain the same and my sigma will go down and the shape will remain normal. So let's see. Shape is normal, mean is the same, and sigma from 13 went down to nine. So you get the idea, right? So now let's take a look at number two, for example. It's also kind of, Similar to number eight, it's extreme case of left skewed distribution in this case. So let's draw the population. There it is. Okay, very good. Triangular distribution. Um, now let's go up to five and draw the bunch of samples. I can still see the skew, right? Because you know, um, it it uh, it basically repeats the shape of your original distribution. But now that you're averaging out observations that coming from all over the place, um, then the shape starts to change, right? So it's not quite normal yet. Oh, and I forgot to note the, the, the mean, right? Oh, okay, so, well, let's start here. 66.8, 10.5. And I'm going to go up to 10. Draw, 66.7. And sigma went down to 7.5, but I still see the left skew. Well, let's go up to 20. Draw 66.6 doesn't go much anywhere, right? Then sigma went even smaller, and I still see a little bit of skew, right? But if I go up to 30 and draw 66.6 still, sigma is smaller, and it's pretty normal, right? I can't see the even the trace of the of the skew. Okay, all right. So let's let's do this one. First of all, this is how the population looks like. All the samples of the size 1 will give you the shape of the population. Now let's go up to 5, okay? Um, yeah, that looks a little weird, right? So there is a valley here, then there is a valley here, and there is a big valley here. So it's kind of weird a little bit. But the mean is 
and sigma is 15.6 so I go up to 10 mean is 50.0 and 11.1 and look at the shape it's actually very normal right and uh, let me increase that to 20 the average is 50.2 did move and from uh, I believe 11 point something I went down to 7.9 so again I'm seeing the same pattern right as I increase the sample size my mean does move my sigma goes down and the shape at the end of the day becomes normal so let's do this one because it's the last one to look at right so here is the population what it looks like very weird bimodal ish distribution mean is 44.1 34.3 is sigma so i increase it to 5 mean is 44.2 and sigma went down quite a bit and the shape started to change right so i can still you can see this weird zigzags uh, so it's not normal yet but as i increase it to 10 it becomes more normal sigma went down and mean is about the same so if i go up to 20 so sigma went down from 10.8 to 7.7 .7, and the mean stayed the same and the shape is very much normal so <clears throat> let's switch back to our uh lecture right okay what is the point so we just played around right with different distributions and different uh um, sample sizes uh and what happens is this as you increase oh uh, properties okay so um if you have population distribution and you start taking samples of the same size n which you have selected yourself okay how many bottles out of the production line you want to take out you can take four or you can take 10 or you can take 20 or you can take 30 etc okay so uh what happens is this the mean for your population and the mean for your sampling distribution are always the same and we saw that right as we increase the n the mean doesn't go anywhere it pretty much stays the same okay so mean will always be the same for the population distribution and for the sampling distribution but we saw that the standard deviation sigma went down and here is the formula so your distribution of all possible x bars sample averages is going to be related to your original uh, population standard deviation by dividing by the square root from n so the higher the n the more the square root therefore you're dividing by a bigger number and that number goes down okay that's the reason why we saw that distributions were more and more and more concentrated the sigma went down as we increased our sample size the standard deviation uh, was going down so for your sampling distribution standard deviation will be always less than the standard deviation for your original population here is another property okay if you know that your population is originally normally distributed then sampling distribution of all possible x bars will always be normal doesn't matter the sample size if n is equal to 1 or 2 or 5 or 15 whatever it is you pick the sampling will always be normal guaranteed and we saw that in the very first case right when we took normal distribution and no matter how we changed n the shape was always normal in other cases when your original population distribution was very abnormal we, we saw some weird cases right then for small sample sizes the shape was still weird okay so let me remind you hold on i'm going to show you that thing again all right so this for example weird shape right this one so if the sample size is small five right you take the sampling distribution and oh god it's not normal right but if you are uh going to take large enough n then uh the higher the n the more normal the distribution will look okay and statisticians came up with this empirical rule right here okay uh if the n sample size right so the question is okay so you're saying if n sample size is getting higher the distribution is going to look more and more normal 
So when can we say that it's going to be normal or approximately normal? What what is big enough n? So five is not big enough. What is big enough? Well, thirty. Thirty is the uh, empirical number that no matter what you have as the population distribution, every time when you take a bunch of samples and plot sampling distribution, in other words, distribution of all sam possible sample averages, then regardless of how the original distribution of the population look like, your sampling will be approximately normal. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason why I told you in the previous lecture that normal distribution is a celebrity. And that is essentially uh, the uh, content of the central limit theorem. Okay? Central limit theorem basically says that we don't really care about how the distribution of your population looks like. If you have big enough sample, what's big enough? 30 or more. You take 30 bottles or 50 bottles or 100 bottles per sample, that's good enough. In this case, your sampling distribution will be normal simple as that. That again is the reason why uh, normal distribution is so unique in statistics, because in the limit of high values n, high sample sizes, your sampling distribution will be always normal or approximately normal, regardless of what your population looks like. We, we couldn't care less if the population is bimodal or trimodal or severely right skewed or left skewed, or is it triangular distribution, or is it uniform, we don't care. If you have big enough sample size, the sampling will be normal. And we just saw that. Okay, so this is uh, the end of this lecture. We don't have any material which is related to our studio or uh, programming because it's purely conceptual, right? So, but in the, in the next lecture, we're going to start looking at how can we use the central limit theorem in order to uh, make an estimation of the population mean if the only thing we have is a sample and therefore sample mean okay so this is the end of this lecture